a, a case study uh, how to do this wrong. Of course, you know, case studies how to do stuff wrong, going to the news uh, with uh, the uh, BBC, my, my BBC uh, kind of uh, uh, iPlayer adjustment where they were doing personalization uh, for the iPlayer. And I think they've spent something like 75 million quid before uh, dropping the whole thing because um, it delivered no value. And then the, the, <laughs> the, the National Audit Office got involved to figure out how can you possibly spend 75 million pounds on, on, on software <laughs> that delivers no value and not learn that before. And um, <laughs> the, um, I'm, I'm going to send you the link to the uh, results of, of the review so you can publish it for, for your viewers. It's a really fun read. It concludes that they could spend so much money because the project was agile. <laughs> and what that meant was that kind of every month, the, 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 the people who provided requirements could make up the benefits as they went along. Yeah. And, you know, then there's always, always something good that we delivered. But um, um, I think if you're the BBC and you're funded by public subscription, you can waste as much money as you want. And if you're a large organization, kind of it's, it's very uh, rare that people kind of try to figure out, are we, are we actually delivering value with this? Um, but I was um, a CTO of a very small company some, what, 14 years ago now, something like that, where uh, we got that completely wrong. We were, we were technically, the, the team I worked with then was still to this day, the best technical team I've ever worked with. No, no, no contest at all. I mean, we, we had um, stuff that, you know, ended up being called continuous delivery when you published the book, but before the book came out, we, we had <laughs> um, lots of really interesting stuff. Technically, we were very, very early adopters of uh, AWS. We were deployed on, on EC2 in 2008. Um, and, and stuff like that. And, and um, we delivered absolutely zero value. I'm ashamed to say this. <laughs> um, and the co company ran out of money as a result. And I was very, very embarrassed as, as um, uh, having this massively um, inflated ego and, uh, you know, <laughs> thinking that we're doing something that's amazing, being a, a CTO of a company that ran out of money. And um, I, it was a big wake-up call for me. And I, I, I had to admit that, you know, that there's, there's a ton of stuff we didn't do right, but I didn't even know what we did wrong. I, I, it was, I just saw the results. I didn't see the cause. So I ended up um, kind of researching how other people solve this problem and, and, and you know, whether I, I couldn't believe that this was solely our problem. Some other people must have had this problem. And... Um, yeah, that, that led me to this um, kind of body of, of research and, and materials about behavior changes as value. And I think that's, for me, the starting point is really to try to understand what, what are the behavior changes we're trying to kind of push through here. So, for example, with mind map, we started with the idea to help people create very simple mind maps and share them faster than before. And yeah. that's what we measured. That's what we looked at. That's what we measured. And, you know, that helped us define the product with NeraKit. Um, kind of when it emerged from shell scripts, it came out as an idea to help people really build videos more consistently and faster than before, not having to re-record and re-edit every time and, and, and do these things. So kind of s s some idea of, of value as behavior change is incredibly helpful to translate these longer term goals to something that's more actionable and know whether we're actually going the right direction or not. So it, it also it always reminds me as well of the, the, the Microsoft study that where they, 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 they reckon that two thirds of their ideas produce zero or negative value for hmm. Microsoft. So, you know, if you know, yeah, Microsoft are a reasonably smart company. If that's how good they are at coming up with ideas, then most of us are probably worse than that. So we should and, and be optimizing kind of, you know, for having lots back, of ideas and weeding out the crap ones. That, that goes back to, I've mentioned kind of, you know, Tim Hartford's book and, and Palczynski Principles. And uh, so Palczynski, Piotr Palczynski hmm. is, is uh, uh, the, 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 like totally wonderful uh, 
kind of um, story to research. He was a Russian civil engineer uh, who was erased from history by Stalin. And uh, he was um, a, a, a civil engineer uh, a, during the late imperial period and, and during kind of the shift uh, between the February and October revolutions. And, and um, so uh, he was a, a minor aristocracy kind of in, in the Imperial Russia. So enough aristocracy to send him to, you know, be a boss somewhere, but not enough to be a general or, or somebody like that. And they were sending him to fix um, mining operations. And I, I, I kind of... Um, the stuff we know about him, we only know because some American student in, in the 70s, uh, by mistake, checked out some, paper, some papers about him from the Lomonosov Library in, in Moscow. And seeing kind of stamps that it's all top secret and stuff like that, went and copied that and, and gave it to the U.S. Embassy. Um, and um, the, the, so he was basically... Uh, coming up with systems thinking and, and lean startup 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, by doing these small, small, you know, small improvements, looking at these things and, and they, you know, they sent him to fix a mining operation and he realized that people are not kind of unproductive because the, the, the machines are bad or it's an engineering problem is because everybody's sick all the time because they're sleeping on wet floors and, and, and they don't have healthcare and things like that. So kind of he effectively use the budget to build up clean living spaces and, and um, kind of set up healthcare for workers. And that improved productivity in the mines so much that it was amazing until the government figured out that he's doing basically a welfare program and they shut it down. Yeah. And he ended up, you know, this whole, uh, the, 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 the reason why uh, I, I really think people should study his, his life and his story. And the, there's a book about him called The Ghost of the Executed Engineer. Because he was kind of um, between the revolutions, he, he was constantly sent to prison and then pulled out of prison to sort things out because he was the only one who can sort <laughs> things out. And um, I, I, and as a kind of as a typical engineer, uh, he was really bad at politics. And I think lots yeah. of people in our industry are bad at that. And and you know he um, at some point he escaped kind of um, Soviet Russia only to come back and ties to build the world's biggest uh, water, water dam. Because I think the Americans built the Hoover Dam and, and, and Stalin mm. wanted a bigger one. And then he ended up complaining about the project and explaining how it's pointless from a perspective of producing you know, electrical energy because it's going to cost too much. It's risky. It's much better to build lots of small hydroelectric plants and, and things like that. And um, he actually got kind of executed by the KGB. And I think his wife got executed by the KGB as well. And, and, and you know, that's uh, being an engineering voice of reason in an organization that doesn't want to listen because Stalin wanted a big fucking dam. He didn't want electrical yeah. energy. Um, is, is often uh, dangerous. And, and lots of people who listen to, you know, your... your Video streams are probably in an engineering profession fighting with politics and not even understanding that they're kind of fighting, they're fighting a game that is totally on a different level. But um, I th yeah, so he, his life is and, and his story is, is wonderful to read. Check out the book of the, the, the Ghost of the Executive Engineer because he kind of predicted a lot of the stuff that happened later. Um, and um, kind of fr fr from that perspective, I think, you know, having like good engineering practice and good systems thinking can help a lot by opening up some really non-intuitive solutions. Like, yeah. you know, should we fix this thing instead of this thing because it has a cause and effect there? And, and um, th th that's why I think systems thinking and, and, and engineering practices are something that is like critically, critically important to, to handle this kind of massive complexity that we're dealing with today. And um, unfortunately, yeah, people approach it too naively. So we measure stuff that shouldn't really matter. We, you know, delay feedback where we shouldn't really delay feedback. We kind of um, delude ourselves as an industry very often thinking yeah. that we're doing well and we're not. Um, but on the other hand, there's just too much money floating around now and, and people are kind of 
constantly building stuff that nobody needs. I think may, yeah. maybe this is just a welfare program for, you know, for, for, for developers, keeping them employed. Let me just wrap up and say thank you very much, Goiko, for, um, for bashing our brains in with, you, <laughs> with your thinking. Uh, thank you very much for people watching. Um, do check out Goiko's books. We'll put some links in the description below. Thanks very much. Uh, and I hope, you've en I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.